Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Autumn 2023 Open Lectures Series, uh, and it's brought to you by the University of York. My name's Alice Maynard, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this evening's event. For those of you who don't know me, which is probably most of you, I am an alumna of York University, and I am a chair of the council of the university these days. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. So this lecture is part of York Disability Week, which is a week long program of events taking place within Disability History Month and supported by York Human Rights City Network. The program coincides with the UN International Day of Persons with Disabilities on the 3rd of December, the aim of which is to promote the human rights and well-being of people who identify as disabled or as having an impairment in all spheres of society and increases awareness of their situation in every aspect of political, social, economic and cultural life. So I am absolutely delighted to uh, welcome to this event uh, Lucy Webster. Lucy is a journalist covering disability issues in politics, society and culture for leading publications, including The Guardian, The Times and The Financial Times. She's well known for the work she does to dis demystify disability and to explain ableism to new audiences, both on social media and as a public speaker. Her newsletter, The View From Down Here, is one of the most prominent anti-ableism publications online, and it's led to her first memoir about the joys and the unseen realities of being a disabled woman, which we will be discussing today. So welcome, Lucy, and thank you very much for writing such an amazing book. I absolutely loved it. Uh, and in some ways, I was a bit terrified by it because uh, I'm very old. Um, I'm nearly pensionable age. And uh, I found some of the things echoed for me so much in, in my own uh, life experience that I was both excited to find someone who shared so many, so many um, issues and joys and problems and so on, but also a bit disappointed that we haven't, that as a younger disabled woman, you haven't found that many differences in your experience. So, uh, so welcome. And um, thank you for having me. I would love to start by uh, talking to you about um, about the concept of ableism. Do you want to talk to us a bit more about that? Sure. Um, so, ableism, as I define it in the book, is um, the discrimination that disabled people face, and the point that I'm trying to make is that it happens at both kind of the person level bet between individuals, and it happens systemically throughout society. And it's really important that we remember both of those things. Um, because they're both really powerful forces. Um, and in, in the book, the specific brand of ableism that I focus on is um, the ableism that combined with, and it is often in tension with sexism that you and I face as disabled women. Yeah, so you mentioned a bit about um, the difference between uh, becoming disabled later and being disabled from birth. Would you like to talk a bit more about that? I, I'm, I'm always interested in the difference between the two because I think the experiences are different in many ways. 
um, and similar in in others. So, what's been your experience of yeah, sharing um, with people? It's hard. To, it's hard to compare them because everybody no one experiences both. <laughs> um, but I've been disabled since I was born. Um, I think in some way that's easier, right? Because I've never known different this is my body, this is the world as it treats me. Um but I think somehow that especially when I was younger, I think that meant that I could normalize it a bit to myself and and to the way that the world treats disabled people and disabled women should not be normalized. And I had to kind of learn that this was wrong, but also that something could be done about it. Um, but I think if you become disabled, this kind of contrast in how you treat it is, I imagine quite obvious. Um, so, you know, I think it's sort of one half a certain of the other. And maybe it's better or worse, I think. Yeah, I, I, I'm just always interested because I also have been disabled since birth. Um, and and uh, mine's a progressive impairment. Mm. So uh, in some ways I've kind of become more disabled, but I always have been. And, and I think there is that issue of normalization, but at the same time, one of the things that I found when I was young and was, and I found echoes of this in your book, I, I found I was trying to be normal. Mm. I spent the first 30 years of my life yeah. thinking that what I needed to do was be normal. Did you yeah. find that was an issue for you? Yeah, and if I was somehow tried hard enough and would excellent enough, uh, everything would magically stop applying to me. Um, and yeah, I really had to learn and, and learn that it was not my fault. Um, but I think, I don't know if you had this experience, but something I wrote about in the book is how I was really isolated from other disabled people um, growing up. So I kind of felt like it was only happening to me what was happening, and therefore it was quite easy to blame myself. Um, but then meeting other disabled people and finding that we had really similar experiences was a bit of a light bulb moment in the sense that I realised that it wasn't what I was doing, it was what society was doing. Um, and then that really helped me kind of, not in one go, it's taken years, but, but stop trying to conform as a way of avoiding everything because it turns out that everyone will find you out whether you can fall or not. Uh, so that was, the, that was the lesson that I think I, I hope that I get that across in the book. Yeah, and I think you can you can try and conform, but nobody thinks you're conforming. Exactly. Exactly. Except for the, the few people that go, oh, but I don't think of you as disabled, which I now find uh, completely extraordinary, actually, and, yeah. and a bit offensive. I hate that. I find it invalidating of all the funky crap that we put up with. Um, but be it kind of got that undertone of being disabled is a bad thing. And, uh, I love being disabled. I love who I am, the community that I have, and the friends that I have, and 
the relationship that I have with my care team and uh, I get really hard like a lot of the time but that's not because disability is bad, that's because everything is bad. Yeah. Yeah. So you did you talked about um having known about the social model when you were younger, but but you hadn't really kind of, I suppose, absorbed it uh, yeah. in some way. What was it that made the difference? What was your what was your light bulb moment um, in terms of social model? Yeah, so I was just explain the social model. Um, very briefly, it's the idea that disabled people are hindered by ableism and inaccessibility rather than their impairments. Um, and if you take one thing from the book or this talk, I hope it's that. Um, um, I was like, yeah, I was aware of that from quite a young age because I was a nerdy kid that read it all. <laughs> um, and I'd read about it, I guess, for them on the Skype website or something as a kid. Um, I kind of, I think as a teenager, it kind of made sense in a sort of, well, I can't go into that. Well, I can't go into that shop because there's a step. If there wouldn't a step, I could go in. But I don't think it made sense in terms of kind of the more nebulous social stuff. Um, you know, I was quite badly bullied. I was uh, very worried about whether I would get a job. Um, I, I think it took kind of knowing other disabled people and kind of being able to apply it to them quite naturally. So I thought, oh well, if it applied to them, it must therefore apply to me. Um, I also going to the university and I did politics and kind of say how kind of everything is socially constructed and there was no good reason that I was excluded. There was nothing about my body that made me need to be excluded from things. It was other people's reactions. I guess I'm finding spaces where I wouldn't exclude it made it really obvious that it couldn't have been my body that was the problem because my body was always my body. Um, so it must have been the social political structure around me, um, which was a good thing to learn at 1920, I think. Yeah. I, I I am eternally grateful to my sister, for, who also had an impairment, same impairment as me, uh, and I'm eternally grateful to her for introducing me to the social model, mm. which actually made a massive difference to my daily life because I stopped pretending to be normal. Yeah. Uh, and that was immensely uh, de-stressing, actually, yeah. which was quite nice. Yeah. But, I also, I, I grew up in a slightly different way because I had a sister. Mm -hmm. She was five years older than me and, and she, her impairment was uh, more severe from the beginning than mine. So I could kind of see where I was going, if you, if you see, put it that way. Um, and also I, I went to uh, what they delight to call a special school. Mm -hmm. And I'm... I'm curious as to whether you think that if you had gone to a, a school where there were other disabled people, uh, other disabled children, would that have made a difference to you? I'm, you I'm sure it would have. I mean, you know, I 
had a certain bizarre experience and the only day I go to a, for one of a better word, mainstream school, I went to a really high achieving girls school, which was a fairly terrible experience. I would not recommend. Um, um, I was actually a disabled kid, not only there, but, but they never had or seemingly will ever have. Um, I was incredibly isolated. Um, and kind of couldn't see where my life was going to go and how it was going to, like, work. Um, but more than that, it was the disabled people went on the telly, disabled people went in the papers. They, I, there was no way for me to see good, happy, adult disabled lives. So I kind of assumed that I would be in the same boat as, as I would at school as an adult. And that's not been true at all. Um, so with that lack of hope that things were going to get better, that was very hard to deal with. And also that lack of representation yeah, you know, it was bad for me, but it was also bad for the girls who were bullying me because they didn't have any positive representation or disability either. So all we all quite a bad situation and I think that's why I do what I do now. I you know, I'm a journalist, I cover Disability, I think part of that is that I want to provide some representation for the 12 year old that is out there looking for it. I hope that that's what my job enabled me to do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was, you, you said something about. Um, you had originally thought, and forgive me, I'm paraphrasing you, um, you'd originally considered that if you became a really good journalist and you worked in, in a, you know, with something like The Guardian or the FT or whatever, that that that, that would be enough. But while you were doing it, you realised that that wasn't enough. You actually needed to write about disability issues. Yeah. Um... And I was curious about that because... Um, because I've got a relatively mainstream career now yeah. and one of my theories or my purpose in having in, in doing this is that it will demonstrate that it is possible that it can be done and it sounded to me as if you weren't convinced by that as an well, argument I am convinced by that um, I don't uh... That is true. I do think I happen to be more of an activist than I thought I was, um, and more feisty than I thought I was, maybe. Um, and I, I mean, I kind of went so far into not doing disability that it was unhealthy. Uh, and part of that was because I was working in the BBC, and I love the BBC, but you are not allowed to have any personal opinion of any kind. And as a minority, that is hard, because that feels like agreeing with this status quo. Um, uh, the stage is quite a bit not really welcome for me <laughs> or any of my friends who I love. Um, so that was frustrating in such a deep way that I, and then I had, you know, some quite painful personal experiences of 
sexist everything that are in the book. Um, I thought, this is not getting better. Like you were saying earlier, it's not getting better. Well, I'm going to have to, I have to do something about it. I don't know if what I'm doing about it is helping, to be honest. Um, but it can't be hurting. Um, and keeping quiet no longer felt like an option, really, after COVID. Um, so here I am now, talking about disability, talking about disability. Um, someone, sometimes I just feel like the disability woman. Uh, but I quite enjoy it. And, um, yeah, we'll see how it all plans out for me. Yeah, I don't think we ever know whether what we're doing is really making a difference. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter what we're doing, doesn't matter what we're working in. You can never absolutely be sure that what you're doing is is going to, well, it's going to make a difference, number one, and B, stick. Yeah. And it's the sticking that's fascinating me yeah. uh, about the whole piece and why I found your book a little terrifying uh, in the nicest possible way, uh, oh, partly wow. because I thought, oh, some of the stuff we were trying to do hasn't stuck. Yeah. And we've got a question in the um, in the uh, Q and A actually that's um, kind of interesting around this, which is, um, uh, and and I just thought I'd ask you first, what what changes have you seen? in policy uh, regarding disability in your life yet? Oh, no. No, it's not. It's not going well. <laughs> uh, I was born 11 months before the first ever disability rights law in this country, which is mad. How I feel about a hundred years old. I'm not that old. Like, it shouldn't be that recent, but it is. And there's a lot of, you know, I was young when this happened, but I remember quite a lot of excitement about the Equality Act. And the Equality Act had done absolutely nothing of any real significance because it's unenforceable, there is no enforcement mechanism apart from disabled people suing people, which costs a lot of money and a lot of energy and a lot of time. And if you sued everyone who would ever this, you'd be dead within a week from a doorstep, right? So, the Equality Act is more of a theoretical instrument than an actual practice, I feel. Um, and it's just said there since 2010, and I'm not convinced that yeah, I think we could do a lot with performing social care at this point. Um, but I'm not convinced that laws about rights are the current public and we have legislated to make all sorts of discrimination theoretically illegal. It doesn't like, it's about hearts and mind, like, do people actually care? And that's why I'm a voter, not a politician. And because I, I'm not sure tinkering around with the law does much. Uh, and I'm an organisation changer, not a politician, so I'm not sure that I could uh, answer that one. I have some good disabled friends who really believe that changing the law works. I, and I think it does to some extent. I mean, if, if I think about the policy changes around disability in my life, I think it, 
it there have been mm. some significant changes mm. and and things like the the removal of the quota system which said that three percent of your workforce had to have a green card uh, and incidentally my sister was considered to be so disabled she wasn't given a green card which is a really good start yeah. um, so um so that that was hopeless because pretty much nobody nobody did that they and, and nobody was fined for not doing yeah. it either so um so yeah, that that and changing the law on that issue, I think, has made some difference. Mm. But I don't know whether the, the move towards greater accessibility would have happened without, without the uh, Disability Discrimination Act. Yeah, I think we haven't moved on moved on that much for I think I think policy was we must get a different out. So to get access to work, make public transport actually accessible, then give us kind of more theoretical rights that don't do anything. Yeah, I think it's about so that policy, not not legislation. Yeah, I, I I I think sometimes actually the policy has gone backwards in the in the past yeah. twenty years. That's that's my sense of it. I was I would have been much more optimistic for young disabled people in the in the late 90s, early 2000s, yeah. than I am now. I, I think it's Definitely. really quite challenging. Yeah. Uh, so, but, um, so I, I, we've got another interesting question in the, um, in the, in the Q&A, uh, which is how did you find the process of writing the book? Because, you were having to face the reality of ableism and that that uh, is, yeah. how do you find yeah. being an activist I uh, love it was very intense. <laughs> um i love writing i love writing um so i enjoyed kind of the actual process of finding the right words and Dragging my paragraphs up and down the page, and all, you know, that, that's my happy bit, finding the right adjective for what I mean is that's my job, and I love my job, but facing the reality of what had happened to me at various points was harder than I maybe had bargained for. Um, I've written about myself before. I've written in my newsletter, I've written about myself in the national papers. I'm used to it in a way, but in the memoir, there was nowhere to hide. There was, you know, I couldn't sugarcoat anything with a nice, tidy ending at the end of 800 words like I do in the paper. And it was hard, it was really hard, I cried a lot, and after, and after a lot, but I cried a lot. Um, I had days where I just couldn't open the Google and look at it, and I had days where I wrote loads. <laughs> Yeah, I think I was lucky that I had quite a therapy by that point um, and continued to have a lot of therapy and was surrounded by the community that gets it and friends that get it. And, um, 
parents that were really supportive of what I was doing, even if they thought it was a slightly bad thing to do. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think I have got to the end without all of those people kind of willing me forward. I also I was really lucky that I had an editor who was not only a brilliant editor, but compassionate and understanding and would say to me, leave it for four days. You, know, you don't need to turn it out day after day after day. You can leave it. You can go for a walk. You can forget about it for a week. Um, and and don't write anything that's too hard. Um, I think possibly I did write some things that were too hard. Um, but that was always my choice. And that was always on my own terms. Um, I, I'm glad I did it, but it's not for the same hard it? <laughs> um, yeah. Did you write anything that you felt was so, uh, so too hard that you had to get rid of it? No. So everything, I, I, I'm, I'm impressed. Um, that's I need I more. Don't know. Self edited as I was going, but also I, you know, I knew which bit was going to be hard. And also I, the hardest bit to write were also why it needed to be written. So for me, the hardest bit were. There's a whole chapter about dating and there's a whole chapter about wanting to be a parent. I knew they were going to be hard to write and they were hard to write. Um, but they were also the whole reason I felt the book needed to exist. Um, I didn't want to shy away from the reality. I, I didn't think there was any point writing the book if it shied away from the reality of what I was talking about. Hmm. So that kind of what I wanted it to do motivated me to, to deal with the very hard bit. Yeah, I and I think it that's partly why it's such a powerful book because you don't shy away from the really difficult stuff, including your agonizing about becoming a parent. And, and I was fascinated that um, that it was something that you just hadn't really expected to be able to do. And you'd kind of made your own assumptions around that yeah. to some extent and just not asked the questions. And I, it, I, I want to talk a bit more about that in a minute, but I, I wondered, when I read that, I wondered, do you think there is an extent to which as disabled people, we sometimes don't ask questions and do make assumptions because we live in this ableist world and and we have absorbed the views and opinions and we don't just say well hold on a second is that really true so that we actually almost set up some of our own barriers i don't wish to belittle our barriers yeah, but, but i think way. we do that for good reason to do it i think yeah, I don't think we're spontaneously self-sabotaging. I think it's that so much. I if we really have a lot of being disabled, it's really, really hard. And if it's really hard all the time. <laughs> And you are told no all the time. Then 
you just start expecting it to be really hard, aren't you? Like, it's not a personal failure. It's a reaction to what the world is doing to us. And mm. yeah, uh, especially I think more than dating, I have in some ways created my own barriers because I now expect it to go badly. And you kind of have to have a little bit of hope, otherwise it's not going to work. <laughs> And so it doesn't work because I now anticipate bad things happening. Um, but again, I've been taught to do that while I've got some bad things happening around dating. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know how fair that is really because uh, Dating in particular is is something that actually is about exposing your vulnerabilities to another human being. Yeah. And given that our experience of doing that kind of thing is not generally good, uh, then I because it, it's it's not quite the same as. So I'm very good. I'm very practiced at going for job interviews and failing to get them. And I am sure there is an element of ableism sticking around there. Mm -hmm. However, um, that's not as sometimes it feels that I've made myself very vulnerable in a you know in a job interview because you do to some extent. But that's not the same as dating. No. But it's a much more personal thing about mm -hmm. you as a, a a nice person to be with and as a, as an attractive person etc and i can i i think therefore it's it is very challenging when we yeah. are not convinced it's going to go right yeah and really and not. so the yeah. first person i ever dated was a blind date and uh about five minutes into the day he ran away <laughs> so then yeah. That really set me up incredibly well for my future uh, as, a, I'm not really as an out there disabled person. But anyway, that aside. Yeah, um, well, but it doesn't surprise me. Like, I think that's less now because a lot of the first interaction is online. I make it very clear what we're doing it because I can't bother to. No, um, um, and the kind of war of abuse that comes back at me, um, especially if it's men, uh, um, is, I want to say unbelievable apart from the fact that it's entirely believable, but like, it is horrendous, and, you know, having that pop up on your phone when you're out with a friend or whatever, it's, it's just disgusting, and I think I write about it in the book, like, it's not, you know, my friends like to tell me that I'm a catch and had very nice of them. Um, but I, it's not that I don't think I have some nice quality or I have any fewer good quality than any of my friends. It's that the world doesn't allow people to see to even get to the point where they see that. And there was nothing you can do about it because you don't have what you have when you meet someone at work where you've got 10 minutes to get them to stop panicking and all the table and to see you as a person. You have an instant judgment 
especially when I'm putting a baby out of the bottom of it, it's a very instant judgment. Uh, I can't come back even in 20 seconds. I, I can try to, but, but it is beyond me. <laughs> and, and, and is it kind of up to me? And so, I don't know, I had given up, but now I'm trying again, and we'll probably go back to giving up fairly soon. Um, because it's not worth being abused and being miserable. There's some sort of a hypothetical thing that may or may not happen. Yeah, and something that may or may not end in happy ever after, actually, yeah. because lots of people don't. Yeah. So, yeah. So we've got an interesting question relating to this, actually, in the chat. I'm not entirely sure I think I understand what it's getting at, but I'll, I'll run it past you so that you okay. decide whether you understand. Uh, it's someone who's asking, as a partner of a disabled person, how do you think I can ask questions which prompt useful conversation? I'm not sure what the useful conversation yeah. is, but perhaps well, you know. Yeah, I don't really know what that means. Uh, if we talk about ableism, I think it would be really helpful that anyone can do, partner, family, friends, is that not ignore what is happening and, and, or not. I don't know, I think all of us, when we see something bad happen to our friends, we want to go, oh, but you're going to be okay because you're great. Uh, I know that when I, especially actually when I talk about dating, to think it back, my friends, who are amazing, fantastic, lovely friends, did a lot of, oh, but you just meet the right person because you're great. And therefore, what this random man had said doesn't matter. And it's, it's very kind, but kind of invalidating of what's happening. But like, I forces you to kind of keep trying, keep trying. And because you know, you just meet the right person. Well, I don't think I could have on, but all sorts of ableism, acting, the most helpful thing that someone who loves you can do is say, yeah, it's really shit. <laughs> and I'm sorry, you know, that it's shit. And do you want to? complain about it to me. And that opens up the space to be honest and to work the mental health implications of facing everything all the time every day because it gets to you. No matter how much you know it's not right, it still gets to you. I think, like, being honest about the reality of the situation is really important. Yeah, so so not, not dismissing our experience, I think, is really not invalidating yeah. that experience is incredibly important. Yeah. So if we come to one of the things, I mean, it is, it's the last but one chapter in your book, the chapter on motherhood. Um, and, and you said that you've always wanted to have children. It's been something that's been with you your mm. whole life. Um, yeah. But you just assumed you weren't going to be able to. Yeah. <laughs> so now that you know that you can, yeah. Actually, you have the advantage that you're sitting down, so it's not going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. 
what's how's that changing the way you are and what your plans are <laughs> um i'm 29 in a month's time uh so yeah the the lovely early 20s where this was a problem for later is a very good um um I think how has it changed? Um before I was a student I was a dog. Um and that turned out not to be an option uh because of everything. Um I always kind of thought I'd do this in my late 30s and I had a while and all my friends were acting first. I'd wait, I'd adopt later. Um, I don't really know why I thought that, but I did. Um, and then finding out that a adoption was probably off the table, but that I could have my own kids has, I guess, moved the timeline <laughs> up a little bit, uh, which is terrible. Uh, terrible is nice, but terrible. Um, um, so I've had to have a like, conversation with other like, TAs who work for me. Um, my friends warned them. <laughs> uh, well, might be coming out uh, of it today. When I'm dead, I, I'm single and I'm an only child. So I see my mum and dad a lot. Um, and yet we never, we never really talked about it. Mm. Um, and it was here, without it. Um, so we've had a little conversation about timing and how it will work. It's been quite intense. Um, so I don't know, we'll see what the next couple of years have in store for me, I guess. Yeah, and whether you're going to be a, what is it they call, they call them an aging or a geriatric mother, I think. Yeah. <laughs> when you're about 30, you oh, suddenly oh, become oh, geriatric, oh. which is... Oh. Uh, Oh, um, being single, you're relying on you know doctors and what have you, um, who we all know are from quite able. Um, so I'm a little scared <laughs> about what, what conversations I have, um, but fairly determined. Um, so hopefully we will get there. I guess some of it is maybe about finding other disabled people who have had children whose yeah. experience with doctors has been a good one. Yeah. And and then just referring yourself in the right direction. Yeah, luckily I have quite a like on board GP, we had a conversation and she seems to be on board. Um, but well, yeah, I don't know, I'm scared, but I think I did all of, the, all of the emotions at once, I think, on that one. I might, my guess is that non disabled people get pretty excited and scared and whatever when they're thinking about having children. I, I've been quite lucky. The only time I ever got broody was when I went to a conference um, where there were lots of parents with kids with SMA. My, the, that's my impairment. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and there were a couple of us adults there. And, uh, and, and the very small children that I saw moved like me. Yeah. And and behaved like me. You know, they looked like me. And I thought, ah, yeah. oh, would be nice to have one. Yeah. But uh, other than that, I have I and actually reading your book, I've always felt 
that was quite fortunate because yeah. when I was younger, when I was childbearing age, uh, single parenthood would have been off the table anyway. Yeah. Uh, anywhere and and actually for a disabled person like me I I think I might my family might have ostracized me if I'd suggested it well, so yeah. I think that's quite you know it's been quite useful that I've never felt that way yeah but, but reading your book I I realized how challenging it is if you're not as I don't know, maybe hard-hearted. Yeah. I am. Yeah, um, I think the words are looking for the sensible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I don't know that it's anything we control, is it? We don't yeah. control it. So. I mean, for years, I used to say, on the very rare occasion that I used to talk about it to my friends, very close friends, I would say, oh, I wish I wish I didn't want it because it seems so impossible. Mm. And to that extent, I still feel like I wish I could wake up tomorrow and not care. Because mm. it would be easy. <laughs> um, um, but I have a habit of not making life easy for myself. So, yeah, I guess we'll see what happens. <laughs> so somebody said, um, it's really interesting that you said adoptions off the cards. But um, I, my answer to your question, uh, anonymous attendee, is read Lucy's book because she tells you why, why adoption is off the cards and what happened. To yeah. her when she tried, uh, tried yeah. doing that it. That was the hardest six hundred words I've ever put on a page. Mm. Yeah, I've written a lot of words in my hand, <laughs> but they were the hardest. So we're coming to the end of our conversation. Um, We've got another couple of, of um, questions I haven't dealt with, one of which I think neither of us probably can, can address because it's about um, access to, uh, for disabled drivers to York City Centre. And since neither of us live anywhere near York City Centre, um, I think that might be a challenge. Uh, although it's, it's a general issue for disabled people not being able to get to places, mm -hmm. I guess. But the other one um, is, is just really a comment on when we were talking about laws versus organisation change versus activism. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think this is quite a helpful thing to end on. Um, and it's, uh, it's June and June says, I think it's so important to keep trying, even if you don't see if it's making any difference. I do think the efforts of previous generations have brought things into general consciousness, and this has changed some people's behaviors. Seeing things from another perspective is so vital, and laws can only go so far, which is your comment. And don't we need both organization change and political change? And she says, keep going. I really admire both of you. So um, as long as you don't find us inspirational, I'll be fine. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I think what I'm saying, you know, someone that I wonder if it's working. I, I know it is working because there has been such things that you said that I'm sitting here talking to you about single parenting as a disabled person. That would not have been true 25 years ago. And the fact that I talked about going to my ancient school, yeah, it was bad in a little way, but I went, I was there, I uh, got my own. Off I went to university and all the rest of it. And, and there, there is 
such change and it's so bloody slow. But but it accumulates. Like and I really like that comment about what what has been done before because I, I dedicate the book to all the disabled women who came before. Um and I often think there's a saying about how we stand on the shoulders of giants. I like to say we stand on the shoulders of giants. And I, yeah, I have to take the long view. I'm hopeful that what you do and what I do and what so many people are doing in hmm. 10, 20 years' time, we will look back and say, oh, yeah, that, that made that better. And, and that's changed. And you can't see it in the moment, but you can see it in retrospect. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's absolutely true. And I would, what I would say to you is keep at it. I'm getting too old now, so... Um, well, I'm... keep it up, and uh, and I, uh, you know, more power to your elbow because it was a, it's a fantastic book, uh, okay. and it's and it was immediately available in audio in audio. I book. made sure because I don't do books, I can't pick them up anymore. So brilliant. So, and on that note, I said to the publisher. On that note, I want to say thank you very much indeed. And thanks to our audience and for the questions, some of which we haven't been able to answer, one of which we haven't been able to answer. I'm sorry about that, but we're coming to the end. Um, and if you would like to purchase a special copy of Lucy's book, uh, which is stamped with Lucy's signature, uh, you can do so from Fox Lane Books, which is the, um, the wonderful bookseller on the York campus, I think. And, uh, and this, the recording of this event is going to be available on the York Ideas YouTube channel. So if you didn't catch it all, um, or if you want to hear Lucy's words of wisdom again, um, please feel free to get on YouTube and have a look. And you're going to be contacted by email um, when the video is available to view. So I have really enjoyed talking to you and I find it incredibly encouraging that you're out there doing what you do. And I would thank like you. to say thank you Great. so much. Yeah, thank you.